Hey guys! Debt is heavy like grief. Death is light like a feather. Now, when we talk about Japan's participation in World War II, almost everybody remembers immediately the kamikaze pilots that aimed their planes at the Allies' ships. But the truth is both more complex and tragic. In the last few years of World War II, Japan was not doing well. Their armed forces were inferior to the Allies. Their air force wasn't as strong as it was before, and the Japanese had lost many experienced pilots during the war. The government understood the combination of better training and financing for the American pilots, as well as the better planes used by the Allies, made it impossible for the Japanese Empire to keep up with their enemies. The appearance of a substantial imbalance in the Allies' favor was felt fast, and Japanese soldiers started losing one battle after another. Now, the military leadership started increasing their amount of recruiters who would call even university students to war, who were previously exempt from service, which wasn't enough anymore. Now, in the fall of 1943, discussion on creating new tactics began. But when Japan couldn't stop the Allies' soldiers' march across the Pacific in 1944, the Imperial forces needed to do something. That's when the Special Attack Units appeared. They were subdivisions created to fulfill goals designed for suicide soldiers, which clearly demonstrated how hopeless the situation was. The Japanese military concentrated on the last effective measure of defense against the Allied forces that they used until the end of the war. Now, kamikaze pilots became one of the most recognizable subdivisions of the Japanese armed forces. But their suicidal tactics weren't unique. They were just one of the special attack units. In 1942, the predecessors to the special attack units were present among the ground troops. They were small groups of soldiers who were sent on the most dangerous missions at night to destroy enemy bases using the hit-and-run tactic. But there were other official special forces, including the Kaiten, a suicide torpedo weapon. One man would sit inside a torpedo and direct it towards an enemy ship, exploding on contact. There were also suicide boats and tiny submarines with similar goals. Now, by the end of the war, the Japanese desperation reached its limit and the suicide missions increased in intensity. Sometimes soldiers would put on diving suits and hide near a coast armed with mines attached to bamboo poles to destroy ships above them. They had land-based soldiers that would similarly hide explosives on their bodies and hide in holes to blow up tanks that drove over them. The special attack units were created to cause more destruction combined with minimal expensive resources from both a material and human point of view. So they created new transports designed specifically for this goal. Small suicide boats designed to sink ships near coasts were almost completely made out of wood. They were crewed by just one person and the boat itself used an old Toyota engine to move. Additional space and money went on loading the boats with explosives. Special planes were made for the kamikaze pilots called the Oka. They were small planes with tons of explosives in the nose. They were attached to a larger plane. Most of the parts were made out of wood, not metal, because they didn't need to be durable. They weren't as fast or maneuverable as other standard planes. Not all planes were specifically made for suicide missions. They often used old or retired planes too. They removed all the radio equipment and weaponry and loaded those areas with explosives instead. Now, one myth surrounding kamikaze pilots is that they were unusual fanatics. But the Japanese army simply needed suicide soldiers to fly planes into ships. And honestly, there's a bit of truth in that. The military started recruiting kamikaze pilots from people who passed part of the training. And by 1945, the second half of flight training was completely removed. Now, compared to other tactics, Suicide missions demand a comparatively small amount of theoretical knowledge or experience, 
But the pilots underwent a different, more practical training. They should have known how to deal with non-standard problems like gravity when they were dropped by another plane. It's not a normal situation, and since they rode in on other planes, they had to know how to do that kind of piloting. And even though Japan was in desperate need of soldiers, the imperial government didn't just make people become kamikaze pilots. There was a form so that volunteers had a choice. But was there really a choice at all? Now, it is true that there was a form on the desire to join the army as a kamikaze pilot. And stories gathered by The Guardian and national news from pilots who were training to serve as kamikaze pilots mention these facts. The form was a blank piece of paper with three choices. I really want to be a kamikaze pilot. I want to join. I don't want to join. Potential recruits were taken into a room and given five minutes to decide if they would go voluntarily, refuse, or let their commander decide. Now, another story from the BBC says the pilots were sometimes gathered into a large group and volunteers were called for. And at first glance, that kind of sounds democratic, right? And it was, at first. But the option to choose became a choice in appearance only later. Asking a large group of soldiers pushed them all to volunteer as kamikaze pilots. And even when there were three choices, the majority understood that there was only one right answer. Even though volunteering to be a kamikaze pilot wasn't the most democratic of procedures, which doesn't mean they needed to ask every soldier, some of them were chomping at the bit. Now, most kamikaze pilots were young, 17 or 18 years old, and they wanted to become famous like most teenagers. Volunteering to be a kamikaze pilot guaranteed honor after death and let the youth feel like they were important and created the idea that they were better than their elders in a way. So there's a trend to depict kamikaze pilots as super patriotic and reckless, ready to die without thinking. But the truth is much more tragic. Most of the pilots didn't want to die. A surviving kamikaze pilot, Tahiko Ina, said in an interview with The Guardian that everyone congratulated each other and then told him that he was chosen for an important mission but he understood clearly that there was nothing to celebrate and was scared, like many others. Kichi Kuhara has a similar story. He was just 17 when he realized his fate was decided. He didn't feel any patriotic longing, and his thoughts were focused on his mother and sister that the pilot sent money to. Kuhara wasn't ready to die and leave them alone. Both men were happy they were able to survive. All the kamikaze pilots were face to face with an unavoidable fact. They were supposed to die. Some were prepared, others weren't. But some of the pilots did their suicide attack just to keep their friends from having to sacrifice themselves. Now, the last days and hours of these pilots were fairly morose. There weren't any fancy ceremonies or rituals and the farewell process depended only on the pilots themselves. Several left locks of their hair next to holy places. Others got drunk to deaden their nerves and fears. Sometimes they got to leave for a few days to go home and see their families for the last time. Then, during their mission day, they spent their last minutes on aiming at an enemy ship and, according to their instructions, sending their last message using Morse code, a simple, long, uninterrupted signal. The receiving side determined if a mission was successful if the long signal suddenly stopped. Now, the post-war period also wasn't kind to the pilots. The Allies occupied Japan for seven years after the war ended and did everything they could to ruin the kamikaze pilots' reputation. They called them crazy fanatics, too reckless to think about themselves. The new Japanese government also promoted this idea, and in the end, Japanese society think about the kamikaze pilots indifferently at best, and sometimes even with disdain. Suddenly, it was hard for the pilots to find work or even get into school. 
Also, a stigma appeared for these soldiers called Special Attack Unit Syndrome. This meant these people couldn't return to a normal life because they were possessed by the idea of dying with honor and were incapable of finding a new goal. Unfortunately, these ideas haven't gone anywhere. The youth in Japan still think that they were idiots, and the opinions of these people in other countries like the US is even worse. The word kamikaze is often used as slang for reckless and stupid. They are often compared to terrorists, although the latter usually chose to attack civilian targets, and kamikaze pilots and all the special attack units were only used against military targets. The BBC also notes the fact that the pilots did what they should have done because of the war, and they didn't have a choice. During the war, Japanese nationalist propaganda made sure the kamikaze pilots were considered heroes. Back in 1952, they wanted to change the dislike towards the kamikaze pilots that remained after the Allied occupation. The pilots' actions weren't shameful and were in no way criminal. They promoted this point of view in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and didn't meet any serious resistance. The pilots once again became heroes. This is still true in Japan today, and the Japanese will always remember the dead pilots with tears in their eyes. Well, that's all for today. Leave a like and a comment. Let me know the most interesting thing you learned in this video, and I'll see you again next time.